It has been such a good time, hadn't it? I mean, makes me think back on that song that we used to sing a long time ago, you know, a good time was had by all. Anyone remember that old Southern Gospel song? They look at me and go, no, I don't. <laughs> Jack does. Oh, just, just wonderful. It's, it's, we were excited months ago and Jack called us and asked us to come. And so we've been praying and believing ever since. And one of the things I've just been praying for is, uh, God, I just desire your spirit to move in the services. The, the altars is the most important thing and what happens. Use the worship to prepare us. Use the word to prepare us. But God, that altar time, that altar time is where things happen, where we're transformed and we're changed. Um, I just want to thank everyone. There's been so many things you've uh, you know, done for us through the week, whether it's, you know, prepare wonderful food and, and go out of your way to do that, the, the, the hospitality that you have shown us, the love you've shown us, you, you don't even know us, and we appreciate that so much. Um, you know, it's always, it's always a little unnerving to come into a church because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if anyone will even say amen. Uh, you don't know if anyone will even respond to an altar. You don't know what kind of church it is. All I got to say is hallelujah, what a great church. What a great body of people you are. And, and I'm just not blowing smoke. I'm blowing Holy Ghost smoke right now. And I'm telling you, you're good people. Awesome people that, that love God. And I just challenge you to storm this community for Jesus. Get on fire for God and storm it for Jesus. It's been wonderful. Uh, one of the things that I want to make sure I'm telling everybody uh, right now, because we'll have another altar service tonight, and one thing that I want to make sure and do before we leave is get Pastor Jack and Christine and his family up here before this service is over tonight and get our hands on them and pray for them. That's what revival's all about. And imparting something into them from God. And so I just assigned all of you that responsibility to not let us forget to do that, all right? Um, uh, Jeremiah, what was that? That was the best hot dog you've ever brought. I've never had a hot dog like that. I, I can't say that name. A kolache? Well, it was a wonderful hot dog, and there was no mustard, and there was no ketchup, and there was no relish. But I got this surprise at my hotel room today, and I warmed that thing up in the microwave and cried out, Dear Jesus! That old song that says, I fell on my knees and cried, Holy! <laughs> Woo! That was good! It was good! Oh, man, I know. Crazy, crazy stuff sometimes. But, hey, I'm excited tonight to get up here and uh, talk to you one more time. I must have left my cell phone in the car, Holly. I don't have it to prop up my notes. I'm very excited. I told you and I won't talk about the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, we're coming up on Pentecost Sunday real soon. And I tell you what, there's nothing more that I, that I desire than an outbreak of the Holy Spirit of God. Let's just begin to pray Right now, I felt something beginning to happen when we were singing what a powerful name it is. Father, tonight, in the name of Jesus, every single one of us in this room, no matter what's going on in our lives, right now we just tell you, we cry out to you. Come on, you can lift your voice with me and pray. We desire the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God on our lives tonight. Lord, we need the encouraging power of the Spirit, Lord. We need breakthrough tonight in so many ways, oh God. We need you to pour your joy out on us tonight, oh God. So we open our hearts. We open our mind. We yield to you. We surrender to you. We say, have your way in our lives, oh God. We are going to leave this place different and change tonight because of the impartation of the spirit that you are pouring out on us right now so we're just our mouths are open our spirits are open our vessels open and we just say pour it out on us god in an overwhelming and fashion tonight we say come 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 lord jesus come 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 and usher in your glory in this place tonight hallelujah Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Come down on us, O oh Lord. 
Come down on us, O oh Lord. We give you praise. We give you praise. Woo! Can somebody give him a woo? <laughs> Hallelujah. Ah, oh, excited about sharing with you. On January 1st, 1901, I want to read a, a kind of a story to open the message tonight. A young woman by the name of Agnes Osmond was baptized in the Holy Spirit at a small Bible school in Topeka, Kansas. Osmond received a startling manifestation of the gift of tongues and became the first Pentecostal of the 20th century. That's a fact. It's a truth. Her former Methodist pastor and holiness teacher, Charles Fox Parman, recalls how he just simply laid hands upon her and he prayed about three dozen sentences when the glory of God fell on her and this halo surrounded his head, her head. That's how he described it. And her face, the glory just lifting off of her. And it says she began to speak in a language he'd never heard. She was unable to, to speak English, the story tells us, for three days. She spoke in that, that heavenly language for three days. And it's documented that, that Osman's experience was the touch felt around the world. Hallelujah. It wasn't until 1906 that Pentecostalism achieved worldwide attention. It came through that, that movement we heard, that Azusa Street Revival in, in Los Angeles, led by Pastor William uh, Joseph Seymour. And as the nation was celebrating that, that new century, few people could imagine that this humble event that I just read to you, that this event that's now happening in, in Azusa Street would trigger a worldwide Pentecostal movement. One of the mightiest revivals and missionary movements in the history of the church. This church, LFA, the Assemblies of God, our church has its roots in Pentecostalism. And it's important from a handful of people in 1901, the number of, of Pentecostal people has increased steadily. Pentecostal people were the largest Protestant group in the world today. That's important. According to, to Barna Research, there are over one billion believers who speak in tongues. And Barna says that more than half of the worldwide Christians will speak in tongues in the next few years. More than half. That tells me that the Holy Ghost is crossing denominational lines and beginning to fill people with the Holy Ghost. And that's, that's amazing. That's powerful. The fourth largest denomination in the world is the Assemblies of God. And growing every day. And if you take all of the other Pentecostal, tongue-talking denominations, spirit-filled churches in America, and you combine them with the Assemblies of God, that makes that the second largest church compared to Catholicism. The largest church in the world, and Pastor Jack knows which church I'm getting ready to talk about, runs over 850,000 members. It's in Seoul, Korea, and you've probably read about it. Is Dr. Cho. Tongue-talking, spirit-filled believers. The largest church. And folks, what I, what I want to share with you tonight is on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Folks, the Bible addresses speaking in tongues. It's very clear. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. Jesus said, These signs will follow them that believe in my name. And what does it say? They shall speak with new tongues. Now I know a lot of denominations truly believe in their holy Bible. Because they've went to the book of Acts and they've ripped it out. 
They've went to other sections of the Word and they've cut it out. And therefore, they truly have a holy Bible. But I believe in the entire Bible, from the first page to the last page. His Word is true, infallible, in every way, shape, and form. Several times it's addressed in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, it's addressed. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, it talks of speaking in tongues. In Acts chapter 10, verse 45 and 46. In Acts 19, verse 6, you begin turning through there and you see of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and it clearly says, and they all spoke in other tongues. Or it'll say in translations, they were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, it says, When you speak in tongues, you don't speak to men, but you speak directly to God. That's why I like the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In verse 4, it says, He who speaks in tongues edifies himself. That means strengthens himself. When you need strength and you don't know what to pray, and strength comes within you. When you don't know, I like what, what Paul says. He says, I, I pray in the Spirit and I pray in understanding. I, I sing in the Spirit and I sing in understanding. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 5, I'm just running through it. He goes, I wish you all spoke with tongues. And in verse 18, he says, I speak in tongues more than you all. And then in verse 39, he says, don't forbid the speaking in tongues. Now, we're talking about the Holy Ghost tonight. I know the chapter well. I know that the desire is for the prophetic word. But we're talking about the Holy Ghost. In verse 22 of that same chapter, it says, Speaking in tongues is a sign to the unbeliever. If you've, I don't know why churches today would say, We're only going to come to church on Sunday morning and have a six pack. We'll save the keg for Sunday night. You need to have the keg on Sunday morning. You need to let the power of God break out and touch your visitors and let them see what they've never seen. Break them out of that liturgical type church service. It's addressed many times. And I, I wonder how, how in the world as the church, the Pentecostal church, will just address us, the assemblies of God, how far we've gotten away from our DNA. I think I said Sunday morning that less than 25% of people in an assembly of God church are filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Most churches, most denominations, they, they slam this blessing from God. They slam this free gift of God. They say it's a weird doctrine. They said, oh, it's not of today. And you know what, folks? I want you to be proud of this Holy Ghost baptism. You need to make up your mind. You know what? I'm living in a world today and i got a choice to make. I can either believe what man says or I can believe what the book says. And once you experience this thing, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about what God has done. And I believe that our church, our assemblies of God, our people here tonight, we need the, to experience Pentecost like we never have before. When we read the happenings that occurred in the upper room, when we read about that initial coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the history of Pentecost, we should realize how important Pentecost is to our world today. It is crucial. It's, it's the lifeblood. It's the lifeblood outside of Jesus himself. God forbid that we would water down the power of the Holy Ghost. And I, I don't want to be a part of, of robbing this young generation. I, I don't want to be a part of stealing the supernatural power of God that he wants to impart in them to change future generation after generation after generation. And what's cool is the baptism of the Holy Ghost is free. You ain't got to pay for it. Think of all the things we pay for to bring satisfaction in our life. And Jesus said, I've given you something. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost, will do everything that you need. Jesus, he don't leave anyone out. 
And I pray tonight in your spirit as you're sitting there and we, we go, go through this message. I pray that you sense the abundance of rain beginning to fall in this house and on you. I pray that you sense an abundance of the holy river of God that's getting ready to burst out of you. Because though you may cock back in your chair and say, I've already got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Here's my badge. There is more. There is more in filling. There is more of the power of God that he wants to fill you with. There's a wider river. There's a deeper river. There's a more powerful flow. And if we ever needed it before, it is today. It is today. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 2, I'll do a little reading Acts chapter 2, because we may have some folks in here tonight and go, I don't know what I just came to, Pastor Jack. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and every Everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages, in other tongues, as the Holy Spirit gave them ability. Then if you look down at verse 14, it says, Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. What I'm getting ready to read here is important. You know, why'd you skip all that? This is important. These people are not drunk. As some of you are assuming, nine o'clock in the morning, I'm reading now the New Living Translation, is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. And we'll read that verse here in a little bit. It was predicted by the prophet Joel. They were so full of the Holy Spirit when we read this passage. They were so full of the power of the Holy Ghost, they appeared to be drunk. It's clear in the Word. That's what it says in Acts chapter 2. It also says that their only defense was is that it was too early in the morning to be drunk. <laughs> no one's going to be drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. The only way you can be drunk at that time in the morning is if you've been drinking all night. And into the early morning hours. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. In the voice translation. I like the voice translation. It says don't drink wine excessively. The drunken path is a reckless path. It leads nowhere. Instead let God fill you with the Holy Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, you're empowered to speak to each other in the soulful words of pious songs, hymns, and spiritual songs to sing and make music with your hearts attuned to God. Isn't that a great translation? It's awesome. And so tonight, what I came to do, because it's the last service, and I can get in the car and drive out of town if I make somebody mad. And I don't think I'm going to, but I can. I, I want to advocate tonight. I want to support tonight getting spiritually drunk in the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost. I want to encourage everybody tonight to get crazy just like me and enjoy the presence and the outpouring of God as you're sitting in your chair tonight. Tonight, right here at LFA, as you would say, at Leesville, First Assembly of God. I believe we are attending a potential spiritual happy hour with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Holy Ghost of God. And we have the opportunity to pull right up to Joel's bar and take a big old drink. Hallelujah. That's good, isn't it? I've never been told I could come to church and get drunk. I said spiritually drunk. Spiritually drunk. Joel's bar? What are you talking about, Joel's bar? Well, Joel chapter 2. See, in Acts right there, Peter, he starts flowing right into it there into verse 16. And it's coming out of Joel. 
And he says uh, in Joel chapter 2, verse 20, he says, And afterwards I'll pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and your daughters. They're going to prophesy, and your old men are going to dream dreams, and your young men's going to see visions, and even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. If you look up the word drunk in the dictionary, it means to be overwhelmed, to be intoxicated, to be loaded, <laughs> to be under the influence of alcohol. That's the definition of drunk in the Webster Dictionary. I'm praying tonight that we get drunk on the Holy Ghost. That means full. That means intoxicated. That means under the influence of the Holy Ghost of God. I want to make it clear, not alcohol in any way, shape, or form, but drunk on the Spirit of God. There's this bumper sticker out there, and it says, it says, how to avoid a hangover. Dot, dot, dot. Stay drunk. <laughs> Stay drunk. I got to tell you this story before we move on. Jack and us was talking about it the other night. I was pastored my very first church. I was, I was young, 23 years old, I think, there. Fidelity Church, non-denominational church. I didn't have no Assembly of God papers at the time. I was working on them. And Brother Blatchley out of Burwell, Nebraska, comes down, holds a revival. Jack was being mentored by him. Darnell, who was here the other night, was being mentored by him. And man, we're having some church. <laughs> we're having some crazy church. I mean, I, I think Brother Blatchley, I got to get up here and see me. I think it was maybe there that he fell down. We always teased him about having his sissy boots on, which is what I'm wearing tonight. I don't have my real boots on. He fell down and started taking his feet going like this. In the Holy Ghost. Well, that night, it was just flowing through there. I had whipped off my tie. I'm, I'm up front dancing around. And all of a sudden, I just don't remember dancing around no more. The next thing I remember is waking up in my bed the next morning with my suit still on. And Jack and Darnell, hey, had to carry me out of the church, put me in the car. And take me home. I got drunk in the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you a testimony of fact. I got drunk in the Holy Ghost. And it was one of the greatest experiences I've ever had in my life. And that's why we're talking about this. See, a hangover is the downside of getting drunk. Some of you know that, right? <laughs> A hangover is when ecstasy turns into agony. A hangover is when a high turns into a low. When the excitement turns sickening. Ugh. And the bumper sticker says to avoid the hangover, stay drunk. See, when you get sick of church... When you get sick of reading the Bible, when you get sick of being a Christian, when you get sick of giving, when you get sick of praising and worshiping God, when you get sick of serving and pleasing God, you're right in the middle of a spiritual hangover. Isn't that the truth? And it's a sign that you need to get drunk in the Holy Ghost. I believe tonight as we close out these services, not revival, we are going to move out the spiritual hangovers that are in the body of LFA. We're going to get drunk in the Holy Ghost. You know what the problem with the church is today? Many people in the church are social drinkers. Don't take that title on outside of the church. I said in the church you're a so-called drinker of the Holy Ghost. You just drink a little sip or two. You don't want to get buzzed on God. Hey, in the day when you were outside those doors, it's cool to get buzzed on God with some of your friends. Come on. Someone right now squirming in their chair thinking, oh my God, I didn't think we'd come to church talk about this. We're social drinkers. We don't want to get intoxicated and under the influence of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because we don't want the Holy Ghost to take control of our lives. And the Holy Ghost wants control. I don't want God to mess things up. I don't want God to change anything about my life. I just want a little blessing when I need it. Pastor Jack, 
I just want a little Holy Ghost toddy for my body to strengthen me and encourage me on Sunday, Jack. Just mix it up at your little nice little bar. Just give me a little toddy, a little lemon, a little honey, a little Jack Daniels in there. Stir it up for me. You all know what I'm talking about, you religious righteous people. But I don't want to get drunk in the spirit. Man, that'll preach. We'll get drunk on everything else. And I'm not talking alcohol. We'll go overboard on everything else. Do you know how you can tell that you are a miserable Christian? If you want to look in the mirror tonight, it's when you are spiritually hung over. You used to be full of God. You used to walk in the anointing and the power and the presence of God. You were full of the joy of the Lord. It radiated out of your face and your personality and your attitude. But you ain't got that no more. You ain't got that no more. You're living off uh, of an experience that happened a long time ago. You know what? That was great. I got drunk way back then. But I want to get drunk time and time and time again. You're living off of last Sunday's experience. You're living off of, of the last experience of the last revival. And you're hung over. And that is a sick place to be spiritually. It is sick. It's lukewarm. And folks, it's time to get so drunk in the Holy Ghost that you can't stand still. It's so time to, to run to your well at this altar that I talked about the first Sunday morning we were here and take another drink. Take another drink of the Holy Ghost of God. Jack, there's going to be some people this coming Sunday that say, the altar has brought new meaning to me. <laughs> it's Joel's bar and I'm running to it. If you come in Sunday morning and everybody's up front, you ain't got to worry about preaching. Mm, that's so good, isn't it? We are going to have some fun tonight. And we're going to get some good laughs tonight. But I want you to know what I'm sharing is serious. It's very, very serious. In our Pentecostal realms today, it's serious to this community. There are souls out that door that are going to hell. They don't know Jesus. That there are families falling apart. There's horrible things going on. And they need you to be full of the Holy Ghost. Satan has provided a counterfeit for everything. A counterfeit for everything. I read that scripture. God gave us the Holy Spirit to get drunk on. And the enemy gave alcohol to get drunk on. And the Holy Spirit, it's forever. And so tonight what I'm going to do is I'm going to share some observations of a drunk person and relate it to some observations of what we should be like. See, most Christians are talking about quitting. And most Christians are talking about giving up. You always know a drunk by the way they talk. Come on. You always know by the way they talk. But Christians are quitting, giving up. They're talking defeated. They're talking how sorry their life is, how beat up their life is. And you know what our problem is? We're not drunk on the Holy Ghost. Because when you get drunk, you change the way you talk. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Our tongue has the power of life and death, and they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it. You'll either indulge in death or indulge in life. You know a drunk by the way they talk. And Psalm 1914 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in the sight of the Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And that's what happened in the upper room when we read about the story in Acts chapter 2. The Bible says they got filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak with other tongues. And they were so filled with the Holy Spirit that they were under the control and the influence of the Holy Spirit. And they did not talk the same anymore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's the first thing that the Holy Spirit does when he comes into your life is he changes the way you've been talking. He changes the way you've been talking. Instead of that sorry, oh, down on me, six to, first John chapter four, verse four, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Because I got the whole, Jesus and the Holy Ghost in me. He that believes on me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than he. 
These things he shall do because I go unto my Father. And I've baptized you in the Spirit. Luke chapter 4, 18, 4 verse 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Sent me to proclaim to the captives that they'll be released. And that the blind will see and the oppressed will be set free. That's how people filled with the Holy Ghost begin to talk. Delight yourself in the prosperity of your servant. And I just kind of took some of these and began to break them out into some different wording. Like Psalm 1, where it's talking about meditating on the word and delighting in the word. Like a tree planted by the rivers of living water where the leaf does not fade. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you start reading a scripture like that and you say, I, I'm, a blessed, I, I'm, I'm being a blessing to people today. I'm winning souls today. I'm encouraging people today. My leaf does not wither. My life is full of strength and abundance. It's God's strength. I'm prospering in my mind. I'm prospering in my spirit. I'm prospering in my finances. I'm prospering in my marriage. I'm prospering in my relationships. I'm prospering in every area of my life. That's what happens when you're full of the Holy Ghost. That's how you talk. I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out. I'm the head not the tail. I'm the first and not the last. I'm above and not beneath. Drunks talk different. And spiritually drunk people should be too. A, a drunk is always close to another binge. They're always close to, to falling off the wagon again. And let me tell you something. My wife knows all about it working at the homeless shelter. You can start counting the days when the other binge is coming. When things get rough, when things get bad, when the day's hard, what's most of the world do to overcome those bad times, those bad days? They go home and they pop the top on a couple drinks. I got one of my friends from work I've known for a long time, been trying to lead him to the Lord, did the, did the funeral for his brother, did the funeral for his wife. Most recently he said, I just drink a couple a night and end it with a shot of scotch. It's no big deal. They get good and drunk. When life gets bad for a Christian, we're supposed to get Holy Ghost drunk. The, 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 the rougher life gets, the more desperate I become. I, I should be receiving a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Listen, it's not a one-time experience. We need to go on Holy Ghost binges and say, Fill me, Lord. I need more. I'm falling off of the wagon, Jesus. I'm falling off of the wagon. And I've got to have a Holy Ghost drink. I'm thirsty for more. Please, don't be one of those Christians that says, I've got all there is that I need from God. No, you need to be that person that says, I'm going to church tonight, and I'm going to get hammered in the presence of God. They're going to carry me out. I'm going to get hammered in the presence of God. I've got to have another Holy Ghost drink. The stress is overwhelming. <laughs> Wouldn't you just love to sit with someone sit beside you in church and say, I'm going to get hammered tonight. <laughs> right here beside you, I'm going to get hammered. All my pressure, all my burden, all my stress, I'm going to go into a praise and worship binge tonight for Jesus because I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm going to go down to the altar, and I'm going to get some prayer on. I'm going to have a prayer binge tonight. I'm going to have a little dance binge tonight. You know what I'm talking about? Because when you're drunk in the Holy Ghost, you just don't care. And you can't tell me that there ain't people sitting out here in these seats that you just want to cock your head back and go for a little run. Huh? <laughs> go for a little run and leave all that junk behind, huh? Huh? Come on, go for a little run. Kick them feet up a little bit higher. Boom, give them a little pop as you're going around the corner and say, thank you, Jesus. I'm just on one of those binges at LFA. Woo! Isn't that wonderful? Go on a little shouting binge sometime. I, I tell you what, I started crying when we were singing that last song, The Name of Jesus. And I could feel a binge. <laughs> I could feel a binge. I think if I was around for another week, I, I could let her go. You know, I could get comfortable in the, around all these new people and let her go. 
but a shout and binge. It's okay. Be not drunk where wine, with wine where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit of God. When things aren't going right, when trouble's on every corner, go on a Holy Ghost binge and get drunk on God. Woo! The only way to endure a drunk is to get drunk with them. <laughs> here you are all tonight, over here at these revival services. Sober folks, I, I hate a drunk. Bought these expensive tickets to go up and watch when it used to be the Big Eight in Kansas City. And there's this guy drunk hitting on my wife. Wasn't too happy about that. Wasn't too happy about that. I despise a drunk. Kind of like most Christians despise a move of God. Yeah. I just hope... It just lasts a little bit. Just keep that worship service down and give us two or three good points because I'm just a sipping saint. I'm just a sipping saint so I can get home and watch the NFL on Sunday, even though it's not season. You know what I'm talking about? I hear people back there laughing. I hear people laughing. Most Christians despise a move of God in today's. Don't get them hands raised up. Don't get that shouting and that dancing and that praising and that falling under the power and them loud amens and them hallelujahs and them glory to gods and them joy unspeakable full of glory coming down stuff. I say get the hankies back out and get to waving them. That's what I say. Get them back out and get to waving them. Get some of this spit flowing like I got going tonight. That's Holy Ghost. <laughs> Folks, you know what your problem is. You're not Holy Ghost drunk. You're just a sipper. And the only way to endure a spiritual drunk is to become a spiritual drunk. <laughs> Look over at that person beside you. Put your arm around him tonight. Might be your wife. Might be your husband. Might be somebody you don't know, and say, tonight, we are going to get spiritually drunk together. Hallelujah. We're all going to get drunk together. I guarantee you, this is the biggest drunken party going on in town tonight, right here at LAF. There is no bigger drunken party. And it ain't Thirsty Thursday. It's Tuesday. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo, I don't know where that came from. When we pastored in Milford, we lived in a college town. It was right there, and they, they had Thirsty Thursday. Oh, something else. You'll know a real drunk because they'll get drunk in the good times and in the bad times. When the world's falling all apart. Just go get drunk. And you know what? When the world's falling apart for the Christian... We need to run to church on Sunday morning and say, Pastor, open up the bar. It's not going to hurt his feelings. Trust me. For you to go to church and say, I just need to get down to the altar and I need to get drunk. I just need to let the Holy Ghost feel me and take control. I just need the Holy Ghost to get this depression out of me, get this fear out of me, get this pain out of me, get this sorrow out of me. Pastor, can we, can we just have a good old altar service today? Can we just come in and welcome everybody, bring the worship team up here, and Pastor, can we just get drunk? Mm. For a drunk, the mentality is good or bad. Let's party. Let's party, yeah, play the right song. Let's party. You should always be three hallelujahs away from a drunk. It shouldn't matter what's going on in your life. You just get drunk on God. Everything's going to be okay. He's going to fix it. When you get drunk, everything's pretty, and you guys know what I'm talking about. When you get drunk, everything's pretty. I used to be a coordinator of a team and flew all over the country, and it was amazing what would happen to guys after they're away from home for a week. Amazing! If holiness looks ugly to you, church, you're not drunk enough. <laughs> <laughs> 
If living right and walking away from sin is not attractive to you, then you're not drunk enough. If tithing does not interest you, if praising God does not interest you, you are not drunk enough. You need to get drunk enough that it's attractive to you. Isn't that so true? It's so true. One thing I do like about drunks, I see it at Water Garden all the time, they don't care how they look. They don't care. They don't care who makes fun of them. They don't care what you say about them. See, spiritual drunks, they, 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 you call them a holy roller, they don't even know what that means. You know, they, they don't give two hoots what people think. And you know what? I'm not old, but I'm getting older. I'm, I'm 48 years old, and I don't care anymore. I don't really care what other people think. I, I, I got a whole lot of life to live, and I got some beautiful grandkids and a real beautiful, beautiful life. I don't care what people think. I'm not going to live my life worrying about what people think. You know, when Brother Blatchley blow into town or other evangelists blow into town, I can remember how excited I was, and Holly will tell you. Get my little polish out and polish up them shoes real good. So I knew he was going to dance on the devil's head. And Pastor Jack will tell you that this is the truth. When Pastor Blatchley came to our church, or when I went to his church, you remember what song I'd always ask him to sing? Do you know? Do you remember? Maybe you don't. He'd sing that song. The piano would start. Da -da -dun, da -dun, dun, da -dun, da -dun, da I'm just lost in the presence of the sweet Holy Ghost. I don't know. If, has anyone heard that song in this church? Lost in the presence of the sweet Holy Ghost. There's not many hands going up. Maybe you ought to play that sometime. And Pastor Blatchley, he couldn't sing with a lick. But when he got out of the anointing, it was good. And he'd say, I'm just lost in the presence of that sweet Holy Ghost. And we're just all dancing. Because drunks don't care. When revival just came to town, we just got in. We tore her up, boy. We tore her up. What's the Bible say? It's better to please God than man. I could care less what the church or the chosen frozen, what they got to think. I don't care. You shouldn't care. The Holy Ghost is real. And I wouldn't trade the Holy Ghost for a million bucks or a big house or a fancy car. I wouldn't do it. The experience of the Holy Ghost has changed my life. When I got the, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I don't mess up. But the Holy Ghost changed my life. Changed the direction I was going. And I firmly believe it's never been the same since. Drunks don't care how they look. Nor should you. What you should care about is in the world you live in, that when the world sees you, they're going, my God, they're different. <laughs> they're really different. Drunks don't have feelings. I really like this point. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 35, it says, the translation says, they've beaten me and I felt it not. They beat me and I felt it not. See, drunks go out on Friday night, they get hammered, and they eventually get in a fight. Don't remember what they got to fight about. In the morning, they, they wake up and their nose is it's pointed this way and their eyes black and their lips split. And they look in the mirror and they said, well, what happened? I don't even feel it. I don't even remember it. Because drunks don't have any feelings. Well, how does this apply to us, the church? Pastor Chris, I'll tell you. Because so many of us have to tiptoe around each other. All these other Christians in the church. Because they might get offended. They get offended. You won't believe. This guy came down from Missouri and he preached about getting drunk in our church. I can't believe it. I can't believe he did that. He shouted. He spit. Everything else. There's no way he went to one of them Assembly God Bible colleges. You know what? I didn't. <laughs> I got filled with the power of God. You know that's right. You know that's right. 
The pastor, he preached at me today. That guy come down here, he preached at me today. Can you believe that? He told us to not sit on our butts and get out of the down here altar. He said we needed more of God. Well, I never, I've been serving God for 30 years. I've read through my Bible at least one time. Drunks don't have feelings. And we need to quit tippy-toeing around. You know what your problem is. You need to get drunk. Because when you get drunk, people don't offend you. People don't hurt your feelings. They didn't shake my hand today. They didn't talk to me today. They didn't pay no attention. Pastor, don't ever have me come up on the platform. Pastor, don't ever have me pray. Pastor, don't ever call me, talk to me, take me to lunch. Let me tell you something. You ain't filled with the Holy Ghost enough. You know what? You know what them old drunks say. They stand there and say, "Hit me again, <laughs> just hit me again, just hit me again. It's okay, hit me again." Some of you been in those situations. You know what I'm talking about. Hit me again. They ain't got no feelings, and that's the way you need to be in church. I love you so much. There's nothing you could do that could offend me. Just hit me again. Hit me again. Pinch me again. Turn your back on me again. Backstab me again. Because I'm going to show you how big of a follower of Christ I am. Gossip about me again. Back by me again. Even though you sit behind me in church. It's okay. Hit me. Hit me. Hit me. Because someday you're going to need something. And I'll be right there behind you when you go to the altar to lay my hands on you. Drunk in the spirit of God. That'll preach, won't it? Woo! Yeah. Woo! Drunks ain't got no feelings. They don't have no feelings. And when you get drunk in the Holy Ghost, you can love the unlovable. Hmm. It's so important, guys. It's so important to get dirty. See, pastors are supposed to smell like the sheep, right? Not polar bears behind a pulpit. They smell like the sheep. And you need to smell like the sheep too. We'll get off of that one. <laughs> Drunks don't have any pride. They, they don't have any pride. They walk around like this with their shirt tail out. <laughs> That's the thing now. And those ladies don't care if their hair's messed up. They don't care if their makeup's not just right. You see them. Out there drinking, partying, it don't have to be just right. They got to be dressed just right. That old drunk don't have no pride. We're partying. We're having fun. And let me tell you something, what pride does. That's the main reason why a Christian's rear end is glued to the seat in a church service, because their pride won't let them get up and, and say, I'm going to praise you. Their pride won't let them get up and say, <clears throat> I've been filled with the Holy Ghost a long time. I feel the Spirit moving on me, and I'm supposed to give a message in tongues. I don't know what they'll think. That's what pride does. Well, I know I got the interpretation, but I don't think I'll give it. I'll tell you what pride does. I'm looking for my brother in here. He's in here somewhere. Where's the big tall dude? Did, there he is! The other night, the Lord told me to walk over there and tell him something. And when the Lord told me to do it, I didn't care what anybody else think. I walked over there and told him. And I told him what the Lord told me to tell him. And I didn't care if he would have looked at me and said, you're the dumbest, silliest guy I've ever seen in my life. I'd have said, okay. And I'd have walked around and went back. Because <laughs> he's one big, tall dude. <laughs> but I'm going to do what the Lord tells me to do. Pride keeps us from doing what the Lord tells us to do. And when you're drunk, pride is not an issue. If the Lord tells you to get out of your chair and do something, do it. Do it. That's what we need in the church. Do it. Let me tell you something. I'm starting to feel a little drunk in the Holy Ghost tonight just a little bit. I'm having some fun up here. I'm starting. How about you? Isn't it kind of fun just to loosen up a little bit and, and talk about all this? It just starts kind of rearing up on the inside of you. But I don't care. I don't care what people think. I've always said, 
I'm going to buck if I want to buck. You know, have you ever bucked before? Man, they did it in old Pentecostal holiness churches. We, they, they would buck them old bobby pins out of their hair because their skirts were long and tight. So, they, you know, they had to get this thing going because they couldn't. Come on. They bucked. They bucked. And I'm going to buck. I'm going to run laps around the church if I want to run laps around the church. And I'm going to dance if I want to dance. And that needs to be the attitude you have. No pride. Uh, if I want to shout, Hallelujah! I'm going to shout, right? Because I don't have no pride. I'm drunk. I'm drunk. And if I want to speak in tongues. Now, Pastor Chris, I don't think the pastor should be speaking in tongues up on the platform. Well, I thought I just read. I had a pastor tell me that one time. Pastor Chris, I don't think you should be speaking in tongues on the platform. Well, 1 Corinthians 14 just said tongues is a sign of the unbeliever. There's your sign. You need to get saved. Hallelujah. I ain't got no pride. I ain't got no pride. The bar's open. Hallelujah. The altar's open. And the Holy Ghost wants us to get a drink of His Spirit. And you know what's good about church? You ain't got to pay for it. It's on the house. <laughs> I got to write that in my notes. <laughs> Give me a new pen. I got to write that in my notes. It's on the house. <laughs> Woo, I love it. I love it. It's free. You ain't got to pay for it. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> Woo. Oh, man. Oh. I don't think you should pray in tongues on the platform. Unbelievable. I don't think you should get undignified in church. I don't think you should do those kind of things, Brother Chris, Pastor Jack. Come on, Presbyter. Get on to me, man. Come on. Come on. Well, what happened in 2 Samuel chapter 6? It says David took six steps, dropped off that thing, and all of a sudden he just, he got to dancing before the Lord. He got to, you know, he got up on the altar and he started running around. And Micah, she, she didn't like it. She was barren for the rest of her life. Let me tell you something. If you want to run, run. If you want to get out of your seat, get out of your seat. If you want to walk up to somebody and slap your hand on their head and say, glory to God, be filled with spirit, do it. <laughs> get undignified. Pride is killing the church. Oh, I preached on that one too long. It's killing us. Pride is going to bust hell wide open. The pride... And Christians is busting hell wide open. We've been redeemed. <laughs> Jesus has redeemed us. He has bought us back. And there's nothing that can compare to him. Nothing. And that spiritual dignity, it's got to go. Woo! It's got to go. Are you ashamed of Jesus? Are you ashamed of Jesus? Then why are the rocks crying out? <laughs> why are the rocks crying out? Why are the rocks crying out on Sunday morning? Don't be ashamed of Jesus. It's our dignity. It's our pride. But you don't know the position I hold at work. But you don't know what I do. And Jesus says, I'm sick of dead, sober religion. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. And you know what I long for? I long for the sound of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, to start filling the church house. 
the sound of Acts chapter 2. And you know what that is? It's a roar of people praying. It's a roar of people being undignified in his presence saying, God, I got to have you. If all you would start praying like I'm praying right now, you'd hear the sound of Pentecost. If everybody crying out saying, God, I got to have you. I need you. God, feel me. God, move in our community. And you lifted your voice and his spirit would reign and come down and the community would say, I hear a sound of a mighty rushing wind and it's in LFA. I see fire not on heads but on the rooftop of a building. My God, what's going on? We need to get down there. It used to happen in the old days. Why is it not happening now? Because of pride. Oh. Drunks don't like to get drunk alone. So we talked about that. And drunks like to talk a lot, like me up here tonight. You can't shut a drunk up. <laughs> They'll talk about anybody. They'll talk to anybody. They'll say whatever. It makes me wonder why so many church people are ashamed to witness for Jesus. It makes me wonder why we can't talk about the Lord to our families and our friends and co-workers and people at school. And I'll tell you why, because we're not drunk on the Holy Ghost. Because if you're drunk on the Holy Ghost, you'll talk about the Bible. You'll talk about your church. And you'll talk about Jesus to everybody. Jesus to everybody. You know, I, I, I've been praying about it for a long time. And I've heard of other pastors doing it and other people doing it. What we need to start implementing into our life is when we go out and eat and we order a meal, when that waitress or that waiter comes up, at some point, I like it, it's a good idea, we need to take the opportunity to say, we're getting ready to pray for our meal. Would you join us here? Is there anything we can pray for you about? Because see, all of a sudden you're talking to anybody. You need to get drunk. And you need to think about things like that. I'm going to try to close this down and open Joel's bar up. But there's a few more important points, okay? A drunk will give you the shirt off of their back. Take out their wallet and say, how much do you need? You know people like that. They ain't got nothing, but they'll take out their wallet. Then... And you're looking at how much do you need? Here's my rent money. Here's my grocery money. Here's my Milwaukee best money. I'll give it to you. A drunk will give the shirt off their back. They're drunk. And in the church, we struggle with the tithe and we struggle with giving to missions. And we wonder why people are homeless. We're not drunk on God. When you get full of the Holy Ghost, you give. You give. You become a giver. My wife has taught me what being a giver is about. My wife has took this out of my hand and turned it into this. A giver. She has no trouble writing a check. She's taught me how to write a check. We'll be in church, and she'll reach over and get the checkbook out of her purse and flop it over there on my lap. And I'm thinking, what's that? What's that for? And I know what it's for. Because a drunk will give you the shirt off their back. We need to give. Oh. A drunk loves everybody. I love you so much. You're my best friend. I'll do anything for you. And they don't even know who you are the next day. I'll do anything for you. And when you get drunk, you love everybody. You don't see color, race, creed, any of those kind of things. You love everybody. 
You love people that hurt you. You love people that's let you down. You love people that's disappointed you. And when you get full of the Holy Ghost, you'll even love your enemies. You'll bless them. You'll bless them. There's a story about this guy. He's drinking. He's got all these bottles of wine up on the table. He's pouring. He's drinking. He's having a good time. And he gets drunk. He don't even notice. He knocks one of them partially filled bottles of wine off the table. And it breaks all over the floor. Breaks all over the floor. There's a little mouse across the room. This little mouse, he runs across there, scurries over there. He takes him three big old gulps. <laughs> takes a drink. He stands up on his hind feet, real tall, that little mouse, real tall. And he goes, where is that cat? Where is that cat? You know what I like about drunks? Well, spiritual drunks. But drunks like to fight. They're like that mouse. You get a little bit of alcohol in them, and here it comes. They're fighters. They're Larry Holmes. They're Muhammad Ali. You see it all the time on Facebook, and this guy just walks up and goes, boop, and down they go. But a drunk likes to fight. When you get drunk on the Holy Ghost, you'll stand up, with your back like a T-rail, and you will fight. You will fight, and you'll say, where is that devil who's taking my home, who's trying to take my kids, who's trying to take my finances? Where's that devil that keeps me broke, busted, and disgusted? Where's that devil that's trying to rob me of my destiny? If you get drunk, you'll fight back. You'll fight back because the Holy Ghost gives you boldness and authority and power. And the last one, and every one of them has had purpose. I don't care how long I've went. Every one of them has had purpose. A drunk will do anything to get a drink. I could bring Holly up here and let her talk for another hour to you about what drunks will do to get a drink. There's some program on TV where these guys in prison... They were taking fruit, putting it in their toilet, in their prison cell, putting other stuff in there and letting it sit there for days and then scooping it out and drinking it so that they could get that high, so they could get that buzz. Drunks, they'll do anything to get a drink. And what I want to say to you tonight is we need to be desperate for the Holy Spirit, we need to desire a move of God over our lives, over the church, over the city, over the schools. We need to have that kind of a desire. And in Acts chapter 28, verse 31, the last words of the book of Acts, Paul's been arrested. You can turn there and you can look at it. He's under house arrest. He's, he, he's in house arrest for like two and a half, three years. And the verse says that he preached the kingdom of God in Acts 28, 31. Teaching the things that, con that concern the Lord Jesus Christ with a confidence. And it says, no man forbidding him. And that Greek word, forbidding him, is, it's actually one word in the Greek language. One word. The last words. And it's called eklutos. A-C-T-L-U-T-O-S-E. Look it up. It means unstoppable no man forbidding him he was unstoppable it's awesome and you know what God's trying to say to all of us here tonight at LFA when you get drunk on the Holy Ghost it boils down to one thing you are unstoppable an unstoppable power house for God. Worship team, I'm ready to open the bar. I have delivered my soul. I think I have stirred some people up. And I think it's time to let God move in our lives. This is not the end of an explosion. This is not the end of revival services like Jack started this thing out with. This is the beginning. The beginning.